you've got to be really excited about solving problems. You've got to wake up every day and be like, hit me with whatever you got. I'm going to, I'm going to solve this. Um, we'll, we'll work through it. We'll figure it out. You've got to have that optimistic outlook, outlook on it. Hey guys, today's guest is no stranger to innovation and progress. Zeb Evans is the CEO and co-founder of ClickUp, which is a platform built to save people time by making the world more productive. Now, since founding ClickUp in 2017, it's now valued at over $4 billion, making Zeb one of the youngest billionaires on the planet. Today, ClickUp employs over 800 people and serves more than 4 million users. Zeb's going to join us today to discuss everything from his business journey to his four near-death experiences. Please welcome to the podcast, Zeb Evans. So Zeb, the first question I ask everyone that comes on today is, how did you get your job, aka how did you find yourself doing the work you're doing today? I've been an entrepreneur since I was born, uh, literally since I was three or four years old. I was always that kid that was buying and selling things, um, creating experiences to sell for others. Uh, so I've had a very long journey as an entrepreneur my whole life. And at a previous business, really my first like real company was social media marketing firm. And I, at that company, I struggled with productivity software. I mean, we had, it was a relatively small company, but when it was just me at first, we had Basecamp and then we had 35 or so employees and we still had Basecamp, but then we used Jira for engineering. We used Asana for marketing. We had Trello for boards, we had Todoist for personal reminders, we had Google Docs, Google Sheets, we had Slack and Skype. And so it was just this like clusterfuck of productivity tools and they were supposed to make you more productive, but I could not help but think that we were being less productive by using all of these different tools. And that was one of the huge fr frustration points that led me to build ClickUp as an internal tool at first. We built it just for ourselves and then very quickly realized this is what we wanted to do um, to give to the world. Yeah. Wow. Really cool. So I'd love to go back uh, a little more if that's okay, just on starting your journey. Cause you've said that entrepreneurship is in your DNA. Um, what do you think led to this? You know, I don't know. Um, my, my family is in the medical field and so they, they wanted me to, to kind of, you know, veer, veer towards uh, school and that, that type of, of system. So I, I just always had it in, inside of me. Um, I just always wanted to, to create things and give people experiences. And, and I, it was just, it was just always inside of me. It was one of those things that I feel like as cliche as it sounds, like I was, I was kind of born with it. Mm. And so your first proper company was a social media marketing agency. When did you start that? I started that in, in college. Um, so that was probably 10 or 11 years ago now. Yeah. And, uh, why'd you start that? So I was actually, I was a DJ in high school. I had a mobile DJ company um, and I, I worked at a local radio station and in college, I kind of brought that there as an entertainment company, but we also um, managed a couple of artists, a couple of music, music artists, and they had social media. I was managing their social media and I just found so many inefficiencies in the way that we were growing our social following for these artists. Uh, and so I built some tools to automate that stuff, but also to uh, report on and show us who was following us, which at the time, I mean, this sounds very basic table stake stuff today, but you know, 12 years ago, that stuff didn't really exist. Uh, so that's when I started kind of getting into to coding myself and, and building things. Yeah, wow. So you're a, a self-taught, are you a technical co- you're the technical co-founder of ClickUp? I have a, a technical technical co-founder. Co um, so I could always do very basic coding things. And, you know, I built some some scripts early on for our um, social media platform, um, but definitely way above, above my head today is what, where we're at. Yeah, got you. So um, I'd love to delve a bit deeper um, pre-click up before we delve in around the, the journey you're on there, but you've had four near-death experiences. Um, if you're comfortable talking about this, I'd love to kind of hear how this has shaped your viewpoint on life and the world and and kind of, yeah, everything you're doing now. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to share. I think the, the first one uh, was when I was 10 and I was in an accident. And I was in the hospital for what ended up being a couple of months. Um, during that period, and by the way, when I was 10, that was 
20 years ago or so, you didn't have access to technology at that time, right? We didn't have cell phones. We didn't really have internet in the same way that we do today, at least the same access. Um, Cause you didn't have laptops. We weren't really mo mobile. And, you know, there was a laptop in the hospital and that was where I started marrying my love for entrepreneurship with technology. I got on eBay. Um, I got an Alibaba. Alibaba had just opened at the time. This was very, very early Alibaba. And I got on there and I started selling DVDs. Um, I found a supplier for, for, for DVDs. And I was actually selling Disney DVDs at the time because there was a marketing tactic that Disney used. It was called the Disney Vault, where they would take all of their movies and then they would put some of them in a vault um, every year. And what that did was it, mean, it meant that they weren't selling it. So what that did was the demand was still there, but there was no supply. So it just jacked up the cost of these Disney DVDs. So Disney DVDs used to, used to be over $100 each for the ones that were in the, uh, the, the storage and the vault. And so I would sell those. I'd get them for like eight bucks on, online and start selling those. Uh, and that was really my first kind of like technology thing. And then from, from then on, I had, had always loved, uh, I'd always been in, into technology. And I learned you know, not really how to program early on. I just more like basic like HTML and, and CSS. Uh, and then in, co in college was where I learned more how to like actually program. Yeah, got you. Um, and I'd love to hear like these near death experiences, if you don't mind sharing, like what, 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 what happened? Yeah, this, I mean, the, this, the second one also kind of led me on this, this journey is I was, yeah, when I was in, in college, um, about 21 years old, I, I was robbed at gunpoint in, in a home invasion. And I had a 17 year old kid put a gun, literally gun to my head. And I thought that his hand was shaking so much. He was, he was nervous. And I thought he was going to shoot me ac accidentally. And that was going through my head the whole time. But what also was going through my head was like this clarity about life where I was at the time, which honestly was a lot of my identity was wrapped up in, in college and in school. And I felt it was, I've always felt education is just the most inefficient thing in, in the world. And it's not fun because you don't get to choose what you're doing. You lose your creative juices with, with education. It's putting people into a box, generally speaking, not, not always. And, and so I, I had that realization when I had the gun pointed to my head that this isn't what I want to do with life. I don't want to go work for somebody else. I don't want to continue learning business um, because you learn business by doing like that, that's where you, where you really learn, learn business and learn creating things. And so the next day, literally I, I dropped out of college. Yeah. Wow. And then that's when you started doing the social media agency and, and everything there. Exactly. Exactly. So I had that entertainment company at, at the time who was already doing things like myself, but just for us, for us as an, as an internal tool. And and then at that time, I was like, shit, I got to figure out, you know, how to make some money now. And so I was like, let me just sell the things that I, the tools that I created already. And, and that's what I, exactly what, what I did. Got you. And then what were the other near death experiences? I have to ask, man, because like, this is what yeah. you, this, this, yeah. Well, then, so, so then the, the third one, and this was four years later or so. I had a seizure and I was actually at a movie theater and I had a seizure at, at the movie theater and I got tested for epilepsy and, and usually almost all the time when you start having seizures, it's, it's epilepsy. If it's something else, it's usually something bad. Um, it wasn't epilepsy. I found out cause that test was very easy and quick. And then, so I needed to go get more work done. My dad had a really bad brain tumor grow growing up and uh, I thought that it could have been her hereditary and that I got that same thing. Uh, and so I gave myself kind of like this like death sentence for, for a, a week or so until I found out um, that it was kind of an anomaly. It's called a convulsive syncope. And, uh, and you know, and it actually did have has ha happened again. It happened one, one more time after that. Um, but gen generally, it's, it's very rare. That time, though, that during that week was when I realized that we weren't really adding much net positive value to the, to the world at my previous company. We were generally inflating people's egos on social media. And I wanted to kind of wanted to right those wrongs, so to speak. But I also wanted to create something that had a much larger impact and a really net positive impact. And I didn't really know what that was yet, but I knew that it wasn't that business. And so I shut that business down. 
and I moved out to California. I moved out to, to Silicon Valley because I had always dreamed of being in Silicon Valley. And I got there, literally expected, I Googled Silicon Valley. We drove across the country, Googled Silicon Valley and Palo Alto comes up. And I'm picturing in my head as I'm driving across the country, like Vegas with startup lights, you know, just startups everywhere on the, on the block. And I'm, I'm going to get there and it's just going to feel like a hustle vibe and everybody's just going to be working and creating things. And I got there and Palo Alto is like the sleepiest town in the world. I mean, in fact, they have an ordinance that prevents businesses from putting signs up. So you don't even see any, any signs for the businesses that, that do exist there. Um, so we, we stayed there for, for about a year. That's where we, we actually ended up building ClickUp. But before ClickUp, we actually built uh, an app called Memory, M-I-M-R-I. And it's a social network. It's, it was a video social network where you could capture moments in your life. And the whole premise of this was to remove ego from social media. So you didn't have, it was really meant to be first person videos where you're taking videos as if you know, you're looking around and capturing moments in your life of things that you're doing. And you didn't know how many number of followers other people had. Um, so it kind of removed that ego effect. Um, we did that and I learned a shit ton of lessons during that, uh, te like really technical, huge, huge technical lessons. Uh, and, and so if I hadn't done that one, I think, I don't think ClickUp really would, would exist today in, in the, the, same, the same way. But the point is, got through that, realized it was a failure. We, we spent just a few months on that and, and just like we realized people didn't want this. People actually do want the ego on so, social, social media. And, and so maybe sometime for the, for the future, I'll, I'll come back to that project. Um, but we wanted, our next thing was we wanted to build a Craigslist competitor. I had been scammed on Craigslist so many times throughout my life. And I've been buying and selling things. And it was also just hor horrible user experience. So I wanted to create a better Craigslist that had removed the sketchiness from Craigslist, made it really easy to pay people and get things. Um, and you know, ultimately it was a very safe shopping and, and selling an environment. But before we did that, I wanted to create a ClickUp. I wanted to create a new productivity tool where we didn't have to use 15 different tools in order to build our next product. And so that's what we did. We thought it was just gonna be an internal tool at first aimed at saving ourselves time. And then we shifted that to, to saving the, the world time once we realized that there's, there's a huge, huge need for this and that this was that big thing that is very highly net positive and that enables um, us to save people time. Yeah, that's awesome. And thank you for sharing your, your story, man, um, and being so open and honest. I have to ask you, before we delve into the, the origins of ClickUp and, and that atmosphere, I'm curious, you said that when you were building memory, you, you've learned some very valuable technical lessons that you, if you didn't know them, click up, wouldn't be where it is today or exist. What were those? Can you share? Yeah. You know, I think that there's, there's so many things that you learn doing your first tech business, um, regardless of how technical you, you are, that you just can't learn unless you go, you go through the, the process of it because there it is it is not just there's all of these individual lessons and I'll and I'll share some um, but then there's just like the journey the, the ride of it and you and you know how to do it better once you just do it once even if it's for like six six months and so I always recommend people just like going out there and just trying to do, to do something even if you don't think it's your big thing do something first that's not your big thing that you learn and, th and then you can create your, your really, your really big thing. Um, but a few of the lessons, you know, we learned on the, te the technical side were uh, one, I mean, you got to be very careful with what database structure you, you, you choose no SQL versus SQL. It's a very big, big difference. Uh, we overthought architecture too in that we, we overthought, we, we, we built a platform that scaled, you know, for, for hundreds of millions of, of users because we thought it was going to be a social network. The reality of, of that is go fast, go fast and don't overthink things. You can solve any problem. There's, there's no business that has been successful that couldn't figure out scaling issues. They've, they've always been able to, to, to scale. Of course, they hit bumpy rides and you have problems as you go. But the point is when you have a business, you figure it out, right? People, people will figure it out as, as you go. Um, so you don't need to solve all those problems proactively because 99% of the time, you're not actually going to have the business there to support that scale. You're not, you're not ever going to need it. Usually startups fail, right? That's, that's, that is no, no, no like untold truth out there that, you know, you, you need to actually build a product and get people using it and create product market fit. So focus on doing that rather than creating the, per the perfect architecture. And that was a huge, huge lesson that, that we learned. Just go fast and you'll figure it out as, as you go. Um, it also for us was easier doing a monolithic database 
at first, meaning uh, this is a very common thing in, in you know, technology now is you want to build a bunch of micro services, which are great for scale, for sure, but they're not as fast as a monolithic database. You can do a lot of things really quickly. And I, I'm actually a proponent for doing that at first and then splitting off services if you need to for, for scaling reasons. Um, there are ways to, to really scale, to scale that and you can go a lot faster. The other thing I would say is using now these days, you can use a very much cross-platform te technologies. Um, so if you use React or Angular, you, know, you can create desktop apps with, with Electron just right out of the box. Um, you can use things like React Native to use almost all of your same code from the web on mobile and really make a, a, a native-like mobile experience. Um, you can use something like Flutter to develop cross-platform. So you don't have to develop both iOS and Android applications. There actually, it actually is native code and it's, it's super fast and feels like a, a, a native app. Yeah, wow, interesting. So talk to us about like kind of early days click up. You're in Silicon Valley, San Fran, Palo Alto. Uh, you were there with your technical co-founder? Yeah, I was, I was there with um, two other people from my, my, previous, my previous startup that are still with, with the company today. That was who I was living with. Uh, and Alex, my technical co-founder, was, was down in L.A. Um, so he came up to the house very frequently but didn't, didn't live at the house. We kind of had that classic Silicon Valley uh, house where you know, we lived and worked. Um, on the first floor and then everybody slept on the, the second floor. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, how did you guys get your first user? You guys launched in 2017. Fast forward to now, you guys have valued at over $4 billion. Um, what, what What's like the one thing you got right in the early days? Yeah, I mean, I think it's all about the product in the, in the early days. You know, you have to just create the best product. And once you once you do that once you're in a good place with product it's about creating a business out of that product right with product market fit and i think we did those both really well i think that the best thing to do to create a product is listening to your users listen to customers listen to all of the feedback you can't take act take action on everything but you can take action on the trends the common patterns that people continuously bring up and that's the biggest, I think, win that we had early on is we were 100% product led, 100% product community driven. And I was the product person. I was the only product person. So I was in there listening and responding to every single piece of feedback. And you can build a product in a much better way that way. You hear from customers their pain points. You hear from customers exactly how to make your product better. Um, it's like they're doing work for you. And, and people are very helpful like they will create designs they'll create mock-ups they'll they'll jump on phone calls and give you feedback um so you got to use your users right you have users you use them and build the best product based on that feedback uh, and then you've got to get the product market fit piece right you've got to create a product that grows itself grows on its on its own and there's there's a lot of ways to do that but if you can create that feedback cycle where it continuously grows organically and other people are sharing it, other people are inviting people to the platform, um, you can create magic. Mm. So how long did it take to build, build like the first MVP version of ClickUp so you guys could launch? It was about six months. Got you. And did you guys raise any seed funding to be able to do that? We didn't. I used um, the, the money that I had made for my previous business. I used all of that money. Um, it was about two point five million dollars, and I invested it my, myself into into to, to click up early on. Yeah, wow. And when you launched uh, you know, after six months MVP, how did you get your first customer? Yeah, there was a, a way that we did SEO at the time, um, which was basically targeting competitors. So when people searched Asana versus Trello, or they'd say uh, Trello alternatives. And we would be ranking for number one on a lot of those, those pages. And that was where our first organic customers came from is, is really where we were using, using SEO. Uh, and then after that, if you can create that feedback loop where you're listening to customers, they're enjoying the product, they're talking about it, they're inviting other, other people to it. Uh, that was how we continued, continued that growth and still, still do today. Yeah. Interesting. So, um, how, how involved are you in product right now? And, and what does your day to day look like? I'm, I'm very much in, involved with, with product right now. So I'm still, I'm doing the CEO job during the day and my nights and weekends job is the chief product officer. And I, I love it. I absolutely love, love product. And I, I'll always, I'll always be in it. 
uh, I'm actually working on the third version of our, our product. We released 2.0 um, uh, about two years ago. And so I'm working on the, the, third, the third version right now. And can you tell us kind of some of the activities, like how often are you speaking to customers even now at the scale you're at? Um, yeah, like what, what, yeah, can you tell us more kind of what the day to day looks like as CEO? Yeah, I do, I do all my routines. Um, so when I wake up in the morning, I do a, a bunch, bunch of routines. I, I write my journal every single day, twice a day, the beginning day and the end of the day. And I take a bath and that's where I'm writing my journal and kind of just thinking I don't get online until I'm done with, with the bath. Um, I exercise and or run every single day. I do like just 10 minutes of meditation really quick and then I hop online and, you know, the, we are very much a optimized meetings company where we don't want to do meetings just for, just for meetings. So many meetings are pointless. In fact, we have a 30 minute meeting rule that cannot be meetings more than, than 30 minutes long. Uh, you need to do pre write-ups and make sure that the meeting has a goal, um, and has the right stakeholders involved. So my mornings usually are made up of, of meetings and um, those meetings, they're, they're efficient meetings. Uh, and when they're not, we, we cut them and we, we change really quickly. Uh, my afternoon is usually mostly catch up for notifications and unblocking people, answering questions, jumping up on the latest fires that happen. I mean, there is, you know, as, as you grow, more and more fires happen. Yeah, you have more people to deal with them. But what that means is that the people that are running the company, um, the founders and the executives and the leadership, they're only dealing with the hardest problem, right? So, so yes, you deal with like less number of small problems, but now only the biggest problems get to you. So every problem is a huge problem. And every single day there is, there is a big problem that we're working on. But the reality is the way you have to look at it is that growth is equivalent to how fast you can solve problems, right? How fast you can react to, in some ways predict, and then solve problems. That's all, that's all growth is. And so you've got to be really excited about solving problems. You've got to wake up every day and be like, hit me with whatever you got. I'm going to, I'm going to solve this. Um, we'll, we'll work through it. We'll figure it out. You've got to have that optimistic outlook, outlook on it. Uh, and then my, my nights are product. So I dive into with our product team and I do product sessions, um, storyboards and prototypes. Uh, and that's, that's, that's my day to day. And when it comes to kind of like the growth that you guys have experienced, like i yeah, I saw you guys launch, yeah, probably, yeah, around 2018. Um, I, I saw, like, the rise of ClickUp. You know, I saw even in, like, on my own network, people are asking, hey, who's moved to ClickUp? What are people's thoughts? Are you always use Asana? Now I've moved to ClickUp. It's the best. And, like, I saw, like, this kind of rise. Um, so you guys have grown really, really fast. I'm curious, personally, as a founder, have you experienced burnout? You know, I think everybody defines burnout a, a little bit, a little bit differently. Um, I've never experienced a day where I'm like, I want to give give up. And I think that that's, that's what like, that's the burnout that you can't get to. Right? When you get to the point where like you want to, you want to give up, it means you aren't listening to yourself enough. Um, so you have to be in touch with, with yourself and your feelings. And there are going to be huge problems that, that hit you that do affect you as much of an optimistic outlook that I try to have on things. Some big problems do do affect me, uh, and so you have to be very mind, mindful of that and know what resets you. Right? For many people, it's you know taking a break. Right? It's just it's just being able to say, hey, I'm going to take a day off. <laughs> As a founder, that's hard to do. It's really hard to just take take a day com completely off. Um, and so for me, I I what, what what I know that I need to do every couple months is I travel by myself and I disconnect. You know, and it's not that I'm disconnecting from the internet. I'm not disconnecting from, from the business, really. Like, I think other people use that, that terminology for that. I'm more like disconnecting from, like, seeing people and, and like, just from the world, really. Or I'm, just, I'm just able to think more clearly. I do less meetings. I try to do no meetings, but it ends up being still, like, an hour or two a day of, of meetings. But I just have more, more time to think, more time to, to just, you know, enjoy, be present. Um, and, and so I do still work, work during, during those things, but I don't do the busy work. I do more of like the strat strategic thinking and it actually re-energizes me do doing that. So I kind of just take a step back. I travel somewhere. Um, I love, I love beach tropical vibes. So I'll go somewhere trop tropical, um, and just kind of think strategy and, and, and reset and read a little bit. And, and that's, that's just totally prevented me from, from ever feeling burnt out. Yeah. Okay. I see. And when it comes to kind of, uh, where your team 
or teams are situated around the world? Do, are you are you guys fully remote, hybrid, uh, or do you have it all? Like, yeah, I'd love to hear. Yeah, we, we're very much a hybrid um, company. We have headquarters in San Diego, Salt Lake City, and Dublin. And roughly 60% of so people are in those areas. And so they'll, they'll go into the office. Uh, usually Tuesdays and Wednesdays are the office that, days that we do. Uh, we, of course, we keep them open for the rest of the time, but those are the days that we push people to go into the office to still develop that connection. Um, but yeah, roughly half of our company is, is, is remote. 40% or so of our company is, is remote. And we've always been, we've always been very remote, remote friendly. We had to early on, right? We, had, we couldn't afford Silicon Valley prices. Um, and so we had, we had to hire people remotely. And, and fortunately, our, our software enables uh, remote work. Mm. So how have you managed the culture side and the team building side and, and scaling that out with the growth that you guys have had? Yeah, it's, it's very, you have to be very mindful of it, right? And I think the, the thing to get right is the people that are hiring people. That's the way to scale, to scale culture. If you put the wrong people in the seats for the people that are hiring people, then you're screwed when it comes to culture. You're not going to be able to, to scale it. Those people are going to hire people that are not in line with your core values. So you've got to, as a small, smaller company, when we were up to, I'd say, 100 employees, you know, we were gatekeeping every, every hire still or making sure we're like, is, is, are they in line with our culture? Um, they have you know, this incredible like, work spirit and, and energy about them. And these types of things, we look, we look for several different traits. And you know, when you find that, you kind of create your own culture, right? You create what it, what it means to work at a company, to work, to work at ClickUp. And when you have that, as long as you have the people that are hiring people that know your culture and can, can understand how to hire for it, then you can, you can scale it, right? Um, but there still is, you know, obviously when you're not in person, it is harder to develop connection with people, right? And that's plain and simple. It's, it's you, don't, you, don't, you simply have a, a very different connection. It's, more, it's kind of superficial until you meet somebody in person, right? You can, you can still kind of develop a connection, you can understand people, but it's a little bit superficial until you actually meet them in person. And, and so we've, you know, we've certainly heard that from, from employees and it's, it is challenging when, when people are remote and feel like they've never met anybody before. So we like to bring people together, whether it be just teams um, or squads or departments, uh, at least re- like once, once a year, twice a year for all the remote people to, to get to, to put faces to name and real, and real Um, the real world mentality here. And we find that that has helped a lot and people still feeling like they are, they are connected. But the other thing I would say about culture is you've got to, you've got to be okay with it being dynamic. You, you, you're never going to be able, at least we weren't able to scale hundred percent this exact same culture that we had at 50 employees or hundred employees. And frankly, you wouldn't want to, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't want it to be the exact same culture that it was at hundred employees at a thousand employees. It doesn't make sense for it to at at that point. You've got to grow up from like that really scrappy startup um, mentality. There's a balance, but you've got, you've got to change a little bit. And so for us, we actually change our core values every quarter. Uh, not all of them. We usually just make small, small changes, small tweaks every quarter, but it's based on like where, our, where our business is and what problems we're trying to solve now and what we're coaching people on. That's what your core values should be is, is, is how you, how you coach people. Yeah. Wow. Um, Tweaking core values every quarter, that would be difficult for teams to keep up though, right? You, you can't change that. I mean, you've got to make small changes for, for sure. Uh, I, one example of this is we had a long running core value um, called progress over perfection. And this was very much in line with this, the anecdote I was giving earlier about shipping. You've got to go fast and not, don't be perfect about architecture. Well, our business scaled a lot, right? And we have mil- many millions of users now. And so now we need to change that focus. And we, ch- we just shifted one word. We said progress towards perfection. We said progress over perfection and progress towards perfection. And so it's, we're not saying that perfect is possible right now, but let's start shifting toward, towards that. Um, so instead of just not worrying about perfect at all and just going progress, 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 let's shift towards perfection a little bit and focus on, focus on the future and how we're, how we're getting there and making sure that we're on the right path. Um, to get there. So those are examples of like, the, we'll just make li- little changes or we'll swap one out. Um, but it's, yeah, you, you can't really change everything every, every, every quarter. That would, that would not work. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. No, that, that makes sense. Really interesting. So um, can you tell us more around some of the other challenges that you guys have had around scaling? At what point in time did you start raising money? We raised funds just about 
a little less than two years ago, actually. It was our very first time that we, we raised outside capital. And the point that we started to understand unit economics was when I started wanting to raise capital. Um, we were very focused on the product and still are to, to a large extent, but I was 100% focused on the product and making sure that we had a business. So we were highly profitable. You know, we, 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 we had a very profitable business. When we went to go raise funds, uh, investors were always like, how much are you burning? And we're like, we're not burning anything. And they're like, what? Like, you know, that doesn't make sense. Like, how can you create a company and not burn money? Um, but I, like, I'm a huge advocate for that. Is, is like, if you can create a profitable business at first, you know you have a business. Like, you know you actually have a real, a real business there under the hood because too many companies do go and get funded. And they don't actually have a real business. And they'll never figure it out in many, in many ways. Some of them do, but many of them don't. And, and so the, the point is that we were at that point where we knew we had a business and we knew that we had high net retention, meaning every dollar that we come in grows by more than that dollar, including, including churn. And so we knew that if we can raise capital in order to, to get more customers up front, that they would pay us back over time and they would pay us back pr pretty quickly. And that was what, that was really the, the foundation of why we, we raised our, our series a uh, was to be able to grow faster. When you raise a lot of capital, it's okay to grow inefficiently, but you have to understand how to get towards, towards efficiency. And I think that's where that disconnect is a lot of times people raise capital and then they just grow, 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 grow. And they don't think about efficiency at all. They don't think about, Hey, how are we going to go, go back and like make this business profitable? Because at the end of the day, if you want an exit of any type, you're going to have to make the, the, the business um, efficiency make sense for, for the public markets or for who, who's ever buying your company. And you've also, if you're that person that really just wants to run with the company forever, you've still got to create a real business there. It's got to, it's got to generate, generate profits um, or at least be like net, net neutral and reinvest all, all of your profits, which is, is, is what we do today. And at the speed at which you've guys have scaled, um, how have you guys managed maintaining a leadership team with the experiences required at the different journeys? Yeah. I think when, when you're hiring leadership from the outside, which you do need to, to do as, as you start scaling, right? early on, you're a smaller company, you can kind of promote up and you can, you can get away with over titling people. As you scale, you've got to see, get people that have seen scale. And so it's all about the, the, the unicorns, so to speak, are the people that have seen the context that you want to create. So seeing somebody that's, that's went from a 500 person company to a couple thousand or a hundred to, to a thousand. Somebody that's seen that journey knows exactly what to do to get there. No two paths are the same. So you, you, can't, you can't like make that overvalue that, that person and say, hey, yeah, they're the right hire just because they, they've seen this. There, there's, more, there's more to vet for sure. But having people that have seen what it looks like on the other side is amazing. If you can see the person that has been through that journey and seen what it looks like on the other side, that's really great context and, re and really great, great experience for, for leadership hires. Yep, I see. Um, anything else you'd like to share or give back to our community on the challenges of scaling ClickUp at the speed at which you guys have grown? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's, there's a couple of things that, that we talked about that are really important. And you've got to prioritize culture as, as you scale, especially on the, lead the leadership hiring. Right? You can't make mistakes when it comes to leadership. If you do, then it infects your whole business. And you, sometimes you can't, recover, you can't recover from it. So if you do make a leadership mistake, you've got to fix it really quickly, as, as fast as you can, because it creates so many downstream problems. They're the people that are hiring other people and putting other leaders in those positions. And if they're not the right person, they're not going to build that, that org right. And you, so you can't make that mistake. And, and when we make those mistakes, it's usually culture mistakes. It's, it's just com complete culture mismatches. And that's, that's what I think is the, the biggest thing to avoid look, looking back is, is I, I, I mean, we've, we made some, some mistakes there. I think another thing to understand is the boring side, side of, of the business, like legal, legal and finance. Um, these things matter, even though they don't really matter as much to, to founders who are really focused on like just building, just building. But at the end of the day, there are these, these things that matter. Um, hiring in-house legal, I all, always a huge proponent for doing that very early on. Uh, because when you start looking at your, your bills for, for legal stuff, I mean, when you're, when you're paying $10,000 a month uh, to your legal firm, you should hire an in-house person for sure. They can do 
95% of, of, of the work and then just use a couple hours a month of, of that outside firm to get to get help on. And I, I certainly would have done that even even earlier for, for us. And finance is the same the same thing. You, know, you, you need somebody that that's really running the finance system. The system behind hind scale matters a lot. And you, you've got to put the right tools um, and the right data processing in place so that you can have insights into your business. And so that when investors come along, you can actually give them real accurate data that you know for sure is is correct because i think when you have we've had multiple systems for finance and they don't really talk well to each other even we try to we try to build build those connections and it and it, it we've, we've had a lot of a lot of problems um with those systems that you you create so those, those things are really important um at, to get right early even early on you don't see them as being important but they actually are really important mm. and what about the war on talent like you talked before in the early days you guys couldn't afford engineers from San Francisco. Um, so you look outside, uh, you know, all around the world, and then you have this hybrid situation where you've got strong people overseas, but lack of connection. Then you layer in the COVID stuff and it's hard to build that connection. And then you've got people coming into the office and they're spending most of their time or, you know, a, a small amount of their time or a decent amount of time on screens talking to people overseas. Like, what have you guys done there to, to manage that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's super important to even enable those people to feel connected, right? So even if you're hiring contractors early on, and we did, we started on Upwork and we would just get contractors on, on Upwork. Uh, when you find the right people, bring them on full time. And so it's, it's a great, I think, thing to do it as, as a startup is you can figure out contractors as, as you go. And generally, I mean, mar markets have changed a lot, a lot recently, for sure. We're kind of in a globalized ta talent pool now where, you know, it was, it's not, these barriers aren't the same as they were when we started five years ago, where you could go to Eastern Europe and get really cheap, great talent. Um, now it's still... You know, it's not as expensive as, as Silicon Valley prices, but it's, it still gets, gets up there. So it's not as advantageous as, as it used to be, honestly. It's just, just how, how the world is, is heading. Um, and I think it's a good thing overall. I think it's, very, I think it's, it's net positive for, for, for sure. Uh, but you've got to make sure that everyone, especially early on, just feel, sees the vision. And I think as a founder, you assume that everybody sees, sees the vision. Um, you've talked about it before. You've, you've written about it before. You've you have all hands and you mention it. But the reality is people need to be reinforced with this stuff very frequently. Like every week, we need, it needs to be re reinforced. And that's how you really create that connection to the vision and, and connection to the mission is you have to repeat yourself over and over and over again. And that matters really much with early employees because you don't have anything yet. You can't look around and say, hey, we made this, we're, we're successful, um, keep working with us, right? There, that, that just doesn't exist. You, you're very much un, unproven. Um, you may not even have a product yet. And it's really just a vision. So you, you, make, you get to make sure those early people you hire are on are, feel connected to that vision and, and feel very passionate about it. And if they do, that's, that's how you can really ship fast and create a very connected culture while doing it. Yeah, awesome. Thank you for sharing. Well, look, um, Zeb, we'll work towards wrapping up. We're going to move to the rapid fire questions. Uh, so the first one that I have for you is what's the one thing you miss in the early days? You know, I miss working on product every single day where I was just literally in, in the product. I was designing, I was creating, and I was, I was building. Um, so I'm, I'm a product founder for, for sure. And so I, I mean, as, as you grow, it's, it's, you're dealing with the CEO things on a, on a day to day basis, um, which is natural and necessary. And I still enjoy, enjoy that part also. Uh, but I certainly miss that, that really scrappy feel of like on Monday, we would figure out a feature that we wanted to build and, you know, I'd go in designing it Tuesday, we'd start development Wednesday, Thursday, we're cranking it through Friday. We're trying to ship it because we, we did every week shipping. Uh, and you know, many times we wouldn't hit it Friday. So it goes into Saturday, we would hit it Saturday. We go into Sunday and we just, we just continue working until we, we hit it until we, until we ship. Uh, and so I definitely, definitely miss that. That's awesome. Um, if you could have dinner with any entrepreneur dead or alive, who would it be and why? I gotta say Steve jobs. Um, I'm a big, big Steve jobs person. Uh, I, he's just super in, inspiring and has a very enlightening take on, on the world and creating something that has a much larger impact 
than any individual can can create. I mean, that's that's what a company is. It's 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 a group of people striving towards a mission, at like creating something that is going to last, something legendary that lasts while you're gone, when you're gone. And I'm very close to that I, with my near death experiences. And he's he has had danced with his, and ultimately, you know, fell fell to one. Um, so I I would have loved to to eat with Steve Jobs. If you could go back in time on day one of you starting ClickUp, but you could only give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be and why? I think I would just say, you are early on, you're always very uncertain about, about everything. And it actually can help you being uncertain, right? Because you're constantly question, questioning things. Um, but it t- can turn into an anxiety. Right, where you're 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 just like questioning, like, am, is this going to be successful? Is anybody ever going to going to do this? Is you know, I think the point to to get across is that it doesn't matter. Like, it's it's all part of the journey. And so, even if it isn't successful, you've learned a shit ton of stuff that you could never go to any school or anywhere else and learn. You've learned so much during that process. And it's going to help you out with ever, whatever else you do in life. So, I think I would say like, don't worry too much about about successive things just in, enjoy the ride and enjoy the process and i figured that out for sure but it, it took me it took me too long to figure that out where early on i mean we figured it out when we figured the business out really but but early on i think it's still important to just enjoy enjoy the process and not worry about what the outcome is, is going to be just understand that it's all part of the journey awesome um last question what's something that you've learned today something that i've learned today yeah um we just created a design system in, inside of inside of ClickUp, and so we didn't have a design system um, prior to really this this point at all. And I'm talking about pro- product design. So what that means is you have a lot of we've got several designers. They're all kind of designing in their own direction, and so it creates inconsistency in in the product. You know, there there really is no design standard, but it's also inefficient because engineers are now getting different components, different designs from different designers, and they've got to go build those things exactly to spec instead of reusing components that were, were already built. Um, and so we're, we're just launching our, our design system today, and so that, one, that one's top of mind. Oh, that's awesome. Well, look, uh, conscious of your time, thank you so much. This was awesome, man, and congratulations on all your success. I'm excited to watch the ClickUp journey and see how far you guys can take it. But uh, yeah, this is awesome, really valuable for our community. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Nathan. Hey, Founder Fam, did you love this interview? Well, if you did, then make sure to subscribe. We're dropping new interviews every single week and we can't wait for you to join the journey. All right, we'll see you soon.